Today, we are going to read the Go Show, The Universal Salty Taste. And we're going to see an example of skillful means again, where one subject that's familiar and easy to understand is used uh, to gain understanding of a broader, more deep uh, um, understanding of the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha's lifetime and the scholarship of Buddhism throughout the, uh, the hundreds of years leading up to the advent of Nitrin. So the universal salty taste. There are six kinds of flavors. The first is subtle, the second salty, the third pungent, the fourth sour, the fifth sweet, and the sixth bitter. Even if one were to prepare a feast of a hundred flavors, if the single flavor of salt were missing, it would be no feast for a great king. Without salt, even the delicacies of land and sea are tasteless. So already he's setting up the point that he wants to make, is that there are many, many, many teachings. There are several, in this case six, but uh, in his analogy of taste, oh, I didn't know if that was going to be a sneeze or a yawn. <laughs> um, but his point is you could prepare... Um, teachings from hundreds of sources, not just these particular ones. And if in those many, many, many recipes of teachings, this fundamental element, this fundamental teaching, in this case, a salty taste, was missing throughout all of it, then it would be incomplete. You see how this analogy works? The ocean has eight mysterious qualities. First, it gradually becomes deeper. Second, being deep, its bottom is hard to fathom. Third, its salty taste is the same everywhere. Fourth, its ebb and flow follows certain rules, the tides. Fifth, it contains various treasures, storehouses. Sixth, well, like everything from minerals to fish, seaweed, so on. Sixth, creatures of great size exist and dwell in it. And seventh, it refuses to house corpses, because they decompose, right? Eight, it takes in all rivers and heavy rainfall without ever increasing or decreasing. The Nirvana Sutra compares, quote, it gradually becomes deeper, end quote, to the Lotus Sutra, leading everyone from ordinary people who lack understanding to sages who possess it to attain the Buddha way. The reason, the sutra uses the metaphor, being deep, its bottom is hard to fathom, is that the realm of the Lotus Sutra can only be understood and shared between Buddhas, while those at the stage of near-perfect enlightenment or below, Prachaka Buddhas, and so on, I have page-turning karma. is <laughs> unable to mas master it. Its salty taste is the same everywhere, comprises all rivers which contain no salt to all sutras other than the lotus, which offer no way to attain enlightenment. That's a very big statement right there. 
The Nirvana Sutra compares the water of all the rivers flowing into the sea and becoming salty to the people of different capacities instructed through the various provisional teachings who attain the Buddha way when they take resolute mind and conviction in the Lotus Sutra. It compares its ebb and flow to following certain rules to upholders of the law who, even though they were to lose their lives, would attain the stage of non-regression. It compares, quote, it contains various treasure storehouses to the countless practices and good deeds of all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and the blessings of the various paramitas being contained in the law. The reason for, quote, creatures of great size exist and dwell in it, end quote, is that because the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas possess great wisdom, they are called creatures of great size, and that their great bodies, great aspiring minds, great distinguishing features, great evil conquering force, great preaching, great authority, great transcendental powers, great compassion, and great pity all arise naturally from the Lotus Sutra. The reason for, quote, it refuses to house corpses, end quote, is that with the Lotus Sutra, one can free oneself for all eternity from slander and incorrigible disbelief. The reason for, quote, with, without either increasing or decreasing, end quote, is that the heart of the Lotus Sutra is the universality of the Buddha nature in all living beings. The brine in a tub or jar of pickled vines ebbs and flows in accordance with the brine of the sea. This is from a saying, or story. One who upholds the Lotus Sutra and is subjected to imprisonment is like the salt in a tub or jar, while the thus come one Shakyamuni who freed himself from the burning house is like the salt of the sea. To condemn one who holds the lotus is to condemn the thus come one Shakyamuni. How astonished Brahma, Chakra, and the four heavenly kings must be! If not now, when will the ten demon daughters vow to split the head of one who persecutes a follower of the lotus into seven pieces be carried out? Ajatsashatru, who had imprisoned King Bimbisara, suddenly broke out in virulent sores in his present existence. How can one who has imprisoned an upholder of the lotus not suffer from virulent sores in this existence? So this is an interesting little piece of writing. On the one hand, it once again exhorts the listeners and the readers to understand the, the place, the supremacy of the Lotus Sutra. Supremacy in that it is the culminating teaching. Notice the analogy. He didn't say that the ocean exists without all of the other contributors, the rivers, the rains, and so forth. What he's also saying is not only that the Lotus is supreme in its uh, empowerment to, and uh, efficacy in attaining enlightenment, but that it, it stands on the shoulders of all the previous teachings, not without them. Nietzsche very much respects Shakyamuni Buddha's exhortation to study broadly all of the Buddhist um, teachings, scholarship, as well as non-Buddhists. What he's saying, though, is don't forget that as you're studying all of this, and especially in his time, remember we just got done reading a, a long discourse on uh, Nembutsu, um, that it's easy to get locked into one set of uh, the teachings, or one book, or one, you know, one of the teachings, or part of the teachings, and then go off with that as if it contains everything one need know. But once again, the point is made about scholarship. Buddhism is a study practice. And so, as you study more and more, it only becomes more and more obvious 
when you study the lotus what its position is as the culminating ultimate teaching but it's culminating ultimate in the totality of the scholarship not just by itself although it does perform with that previous knowledge something quite unique not found in all of the other teachings so teach learn broadly but don't forget to get to the point don't forget the the, the maxim right uh, let's see what the background says on this <clears throat> the date and recipient of this letter are unknown as are the reasons for its writing although we can see what what the point was being made right the statements one who upholds the lotus sutra and is subjected to imprisonment and to condemn one who holds upholds the sutra indicate that Nichiren wrote this letter at a time when he or his disciples were undergoing persecution or any yeah any believer of the lotus several views exist concerning the year of its writing one is that it was written in 1261 when Nichiren was exiled in Izu another 1271 when he was exiled on Sato Island and a third in 1272 or 79 excuse me during the worst period of the Atsuhara uh, persecution. Of these, 1261 seems most likely. I haven't studied all of the background knowledge to be able to have an opinion myself. Uh, in this letter, Nietzsche Shonen says that there are six kinds of flavors, of which salt is the most important. Without salt, any food will be bland. In employing this simile, Nichiren Shonen is indicating that none of the sutras assume their true significance unless they are based on the truth revealed in the Lotus Sutra. Well put. Then he cites the eight mystic qualities of the ocean enumerated in the Nir Nirvana Sutra. But while the Nirvana Sutra actually applies these qualities to itself, Nichiren Shonen asserts that this it is using them to praise the superiority of the Lotus Sutra. It's kind of an epilogue. Uh, the, Nir the Nirvana Sutra was actually a sermon spoken in um, uh, Shakyamuni's deathbed um, what, with his attendees uh, uh, learned along his bedside and wrote down. So it's, there's a lot of evidence, uh, anecdotal and written, um, and within the, the Nirvana, that suggests that um, everything it talks about is a, is a restating of... Um, the, the culmination of his teachings in the Lotus uh, Sermon Sutra. Uh, not least of which is the fact that uh, this sermon came as a result of the beseeching of Ananda and, and other close followers uh, who felt uh, a tremendous sense of loss as the uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was dying, thinking, what will we do when you're gone? Who will lead us? How will we go forward in our, in our practice? Uh, and he's reminding them that uh, for all of these reasons enumerated in the Nirvana, which uh, Nichiren is now citing, uh, you already know. You already have this knowledge. Uh, look to the Lotus Sutra for guidance and, uh, and build your own realization. You don't need me. You don't need to follow me. Remember, I've said this many times. In the final section, Nietzsche and Shonen compares the salt in a jar or tub of pickled vines to a follower of the Lotus Sutra and the salt of the ocean to Shakyamuni Buddha. The brine in the jar or tub ebbs and flows exactly as the ocean does and by analogy to imprison a votary of the Lotus Sutra is to imprison Shakyamuni Buddha. So uh, here is some notes on the pickling process. Salt is added to a jar of vines to draw out their water. This salty water is said to be uh, to increase and decrease in the accord with the rinse and fall of the ocean tides. So it's a simple analogies. The next one will be the four debts of gratitude. Um, I'm not going to endeavor to try to put more than one in one video. Um, I think you can enjoy this short video for its usefulness, and I hope that you enjoyed it and can use this wisdom in your daily life. Thanks again for participating. Namo myoho renge kyo. And I'll talk to you soon.